Well, welcome this morning. Uh, Megan is taking care of the housekeeping announcements, so I can be even briefer before we get going here. Um, just to uh, welcome you to a discussion today of the impact of the 13th five-year plan in China. This is being held with the cooperation of the Tsinghua University Center for China and the World Economy. Uh, one bit of housekeeping, uh, just if uh, all of us are making the rounds in this beautiful week in New York. Tomorrow evening, the president of Namibia will be speaking here at the council, so it might be a good stop uh, as you traverse the Upper East Side. Uh, this discussion today obviously is focused on the uh, one of the two most important economies in the world, and uh, it is uh, with the christening last month of the latest five-year plan after a two-year uh, development process. Uh, it's providing a, a moment in time for looking at, evaluating, and forecasting what, uh, what effects that will have on the Chinese economy. I will uh, welcome today a very knowledgeable panel. Uh, next to me is uh, Mr. Gao Shijing, the uh, professor of law at Tsinghua University, and among his many other accomplishments, the former president and investment committee leader at the Chinese Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, Karen Harris of the Macro Trends Unit at Bain and Company is joining us, and Brad Setzer of the Council's Greenberg Center for Geoeconomics. So we have a very versed panel here for discussing this. Let me uh, set the stage for this very briefly. As I say, the five-year plan just christened. Now uh, it is like State, State of the Union addresses in the United States, a bit of a laundry list, 60-some uh, items uh, included. But it is basically the agenda for Xi Jinping's first and likely second uh, term as the uh, paramount leader, if you will, in China. Uh, it is an extension of themes that were set at the third plenum uh, two years ago. Uh, Broadly speaking, uh, and these are somewhat blurry and perhaps contradictory, but they are uh, a roadmap for restructuring of the Chinese economy, uh, innovation being stressed, uh, higher quality growth, more of a consumer economy, inclusion, shared prosperity, and a, uh, uh, an increase, uh, uh, an enhancement of the social safety net, a uh, even-handedness with regard to rural and economic development and across various industries, openness, use of the markets, transparency and rule of law with Chinese characteristics, and a, of course, social cohesion and order along with a heavy overlay of green policies in regards to China's further development. So let's get into some of the specifics of that five-year plan. Uh, Professor Gao, could I ask you to focus in on a couple of them that you regard as particularly important? And I hope you will address ones that are also very difficult to achieve in this five-year span. OK, well, thank you. Um, I think the biggest confusion people have, or I have, I will say, about this, uh, uh, the present situation is that when you, on the one hand, you see a lot of things going wrong or going down, to go into certain unpredictable areas. On the other hand, if you actually look at all the documents, look at all the party documents, which for over the past 60 years we have always been holding as, at, in, in, our, in, the, in people's words, higher than the Constitution, which is the party you know, party communique of all these party conferences. And if you look at the uh, 18th Party Congress, you look at the third plenary, fourth plenary Party Congress, you read all these documents, it's probably more exciting and more encouraging than anything that was produced over the past 60 years. You know, including the third plenary of the 11th Party Congress, which, you know, laid the map for the, for the whole reform process. And because, you know, at the time, if you read the 11th Party Congress, still at the time you see it had a lot of ideologically charged jargons and things you have to read between the lines. But in the third plenary of 18th Party Congress, which you know, only happened two and a half years ago, you read through those things, all these items, 
they are, they are all, you know, they're so much closer to anything people would call the universal value, even though our government doesn't want to say that. It's, you know, it's, it's something that everyone would think, well, okay, this seems to be the right thing to do. But the first time in our history, in our past 60 years of history, that the party said something, but you wait and wait and wait, and you haven't seen anything happening, or in some areas started sort of going back almost. So people kept wondering. And then, of course, the, that's why you know, people outside of the country are so caught up with the, you know, the, the, uh, um, we call it the, uh, fifth, the, the five year plan. But within China, people said, you know, most people, you know, there's nothing new there. I said, there's something new. They said, no, that's something new about the third plenary. It's almost the same thing. To me, it's encouraging because at least at two and a half years after, when you have the concrete plan, you know, uh, ostensibly implementing the third plenary, you have all the right things, you know, sort of the right things to say. You know, you say, you know, for instance, you you you're you're cutting the uh, the power of the government in, in various ways. You are trying to uh, streamline all the state-controlled uh, apparatus. You're trying to reform state enterprises. You're uh, addressing the major issue of overcapacity in many different lines of, you know, we say the rusty belt uh, uh, industries. So when you look at that, these are all correct. And the cynicism there is saying, okay, so what's new about that? that we've been saying that for three years. That hasn't happened yet. But to me, I said, well, at least you're not saying things to the opposite side. Because you know, if, if after three years you didn't get it implemented, then you may expect someone coming out and say, "Okay, that was wrong. Now we're doing th things differently." We're not doing things differently. That's the interesting part. No retreat. At least in all these major lines, if you mm -hmm. read the uh, five-year plan, the problem, of course, and people ask, is that, but I still don't see it implemented. Only last week we got this sort of new new set of a uh, policy issues coming out. Basically, you know, talking about um, streamlining uh, the, the businesses and trying to cut down uh, overcapacity in steel, in coal, in these things. The interesting thing is that, you know, people keep talking about zombie companies, talking about a very un an inefficient state enterprises. Well, people, you know, wouldn't say state enterprises, say inefficient companies that we need to get rid of. But in fact, people know 99% of them are state-owned, these in, 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 you know, inefficient companies. For for a long time, the government, you know, the, especially state council party, well, we always call it the North Court and the South Court. You know, in the Forbidden City, the North Court is occupied by the state council, and the South Court is occupied by the, by the Central Committee of the Communist Party. Whereas that, well, the North Court has been, you know, doing all these things, so they're they're trying to say things, but it's not done yet. Um, they're always saying, let's, let's get rid of the overcapacity. But have we gotten rid of them? Our, they, the state council has been telling everyone, look, you need to cut, especially Hebei province, which it surrounds Beijing. This is one of the large provinces. And that province alone has the steel capacity of over 300 million tons. You know, this world, the whole world produces about, you know, about probably twice as much of that, uh, that much steel. And China has a capacity of, of uh, one billion times, almost, you know, closing to that. So the reason why Beijing is so polluted, simply because all steel mills are around Beijing. And we're always saying, okay, try to cut that down. And for the longest time, people say, well, that's all state enterprises problem. First time, last week, we heard that, okay, they're, they are seemingly giving up the effort to say, let's get rid of the inefficient zombie companies just allow the better ones to function. What they're saying now is that, okay, we don't care which companies you cut down, just cut down by 13.5%, period. I don't care. If you cut down the most, e most efficient ones, so be it. Every province is getting the order to cut down by 13 some percent of their capacity. This, you know, this is again, to me, this is very interesting because it shows, first of all, it shows that central government is finally coming down with a number. That's good. But, you know, on the other hand, 
so bad that you know, finally they are admitting that they're not going to be able to control, you know, to control the overall you know, um, comparison between the efficient and inefficient. And you know, they're basically giving up what the party said in the 18th Party Congress, that let the market be the decisive force of allocating resources, which to me is the most exciting thing over all these years, because all the years that we've been trying to push it, you know, to make the market more market oriented. And we're always you know, saying a little bit, you know, half hazardly saying, OK, we, let's allow the market to play a little bit of a role. Finally, the 18th Party Congress let, let the market be the decisive force. But are we allowing it to be the decisive force? Does it look like it? Is no. this tension, uh, which is manifesting itself in the efforts at the one, on the one hand to restructure the big state-owned enterprises, but also now to extending more credits to them, keeping as much as possible employment base. Does your uh, uh, analysis of the South versus North Court explain this tension, the State Com Council versus the Central Committee? Uh, I understand that this is, uh, this is open to the, uh, to the indeed, media. Indeed so I, I personally do not have any comment on that. I see. Uh, yeah. In case, because I'm still under the heavy supervision on these things. But my, my sense, basically, on these things is that it's, it's not even a you know, problem. Because in, in many you know, historical junctures in the past, you know, 89 or you know, 76, you, always, you could see some sort of a, you know, opposing factions there doing things. This time around, you just, you know, my biggest fear is not even that. If, if, there's, if there are two factions fighting with each other, at least you know which side you, you want to be with, right? But now, what, what I'm seeing is that, you know, everyone seems, it makes perfect sense for both sides, or if you have both, you know, two sides, to agree on certain things, but doesn't seem to be the ability, or, you know, when you say, we say, in law, we say, able and willing to do things, right? And, but the first thing, most important thing, of course, is whether you're willing to do it. Now, we, I thought reading all the party documents, yes, everyone's willing to do it. But somehow it doesn't work. Why? So my explanation of that is that it's this government, in economic terms, is very much captured by different interest groups. The biggest interest group really is the state-owned enterprises. That's how I see it. And I know you know our government doesn't like this sort of a statement, but it's true. Uh, you know, because I myself come out of a state enterprise. I worked for several different ones. I was CEO of Bank of China International, and I was president of the China Investment Corporation. But when, you, you know, when I was there, I was, I was always encouraged because I could do things. Um, today, you know, if you talk to individual CEOs, some people are still saying, OK, I'm pushing forward. I'm trying to do things. But overall, if you look at overall, you know, right. across some uh, spectrum, then many people say, OK, we, we don't want to do too much because of various reasons. But everyone, of course, is laying the blame on someone else, saying, oh, it's the anti-corruption thing. Oh, they are overextending on these things so that our people are not incentivized to do things. Things like that. But my, my problem really is I'm confused because you know, if you have all the, uh, all the willingness, you, it's so much easier you know, for the party to just to push something. If there are these people, you try to go out and identify these people who are against this thing. You can't see any particular person against it. Nobody comes out and say, I'm against it. Everyone say, you know, um, Mr. Xi is great, then let's follow him. Yeah, we, we have these jargons. So. Going, going back to the five-year plan and, and its laundry list, if you had to identify one bellwether for whether the great reform movement is going to succeed and we can all be watching this over the next year or two, is there a particular one you'd point to? Well, I usually, I usually point to indications. It's not, not on the, you know, not as clear on the plan itself, but, but it's very clear on the, on the moves. If you, if you, let's say in the next year or so, if you hear one of two things, you'll think, well, this is better, this is going more you know, proactive. One is for the streamlining of the government. The gov you know, this is something that has been said by both the party Congress and by the premier himself repeatedly. You know, Mr. Lee, over the past two years, every time he comes out, he would almost always mention these two terms called the power list and the negative list. 
especially the second one, the negative list, because lawyers here all know that you know here you have in in in, in this country your 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 government, your you know, Congress or whatever, they always have some enumerated power. And this the power list is the one we call the enumerated power. So for those powers that are enumerated in your you know, constitution or something, then you have that power. Anything that's not written there, you don't have that power. This concept is not accepted by the Chinese government for the past 2,000 years. Our government has always been omnipotent. They always, you know, I'm everything. You know, you have nothing. Uh, sort of thing, but then for the negative part, you know, it's like, it's again, this is 800 years of uh, history in Europe and here, that that which is not prohibited is all allowed, but that's that had always been the opposite in China for all these years. We always think that which is not uh, prohibited and that not which that's not allowed is prohibited, but now the government first time over the past three years repeatedly coming out and say. OK, let's come out with some negative list. Tell people, these are the things you cannot do. If it's not listed in this list, you do it. So far, we've seen that only in the international arena. In Shanghai Free Trade Zone, they say, OK, Shanghai finally came out with a negative list. Some people criticize that, oh, that list is too long, you know, 200-something list. I said, this 200-something list is much better than 2 million list. OK, it's, a, it's, it's very good. And then they came down to 100 some items. So if you see that, but Mr. Li Keqiang, the premier, repeatedly tell people, OK, why, why don't you all these ministries come out with a negative list? So far, we haven't seen many. We, have, we see you know, very little in small places. But we need to have these things come out. And I think it's imminent. If, if things go as what I wish or what you know, most people think it should, but now I'm not sure about that. And most of my, many of my friends say, okay, things are not going that way. But if you see things coming out like that, you know, I see things coming out like that in the Supreme Court in China, in the Supreme, uh, you call it People's Procuriate, which is a different system there. It's like the top of the, the prosecutors. These institutions are coming out with negative lists. But of course, most people in China say, well, that doesn't count. It's the legal part. We don't, you know, see that. But if ministries come out with these things, then you see that the government is getting serious. Because first time in our history over the past 2,000 years, the people can come out and say, OK, I'm doing this because you are not saying I, I'm not doing, I cannot do it. Even as of today, just as of you know, last week, when I try to do something, I say, well, I want to do this. Our, our people up there say, no, you can't. I say, why? I say, because the document doesn't say you can do it, you know, as of today. So you need that. That's one indication. Another indication is this whole thing that the, the SASAC, this is the State Administration of uh, State Enterprise, keeps saying for the past three years that they are coming out with a plan for state enterprise reform. We haven't seen it yet. It constantly comes out with some sort of a draft, not totally open, but you know, sort of sneaking out to people and say, uh, you know, comment on it. And uh, most of these plans are so bad and so, you know, it's just the opposite of what we think it should be. So if it comes out finally and say, OK, we need to get rid of, say, 80% of state enterprises, which I believe should be the case, then things would be much better. In fact, in the past two year or so, it's sort of regressing because in quite a few industries, the uh, oligopolies that were, you know, the, those were broken up uh, monopolies from the Jurongi days. And in the past year, also several of those re-monopolized. Mm. They got together and they mm. formed, and they, um, with the encouragement of Sasak. So if this this thing you know comes around the other way, then now we know that's the indication that is going to a better direction. All right, uh, Karen Harris. That brings us to the um, question of uh, the use of foreign investment, foreign competition as a sort of market driving exercise. This again has been uh, somewhat contradictory in practice, if not in words, in China over the last year or two in particular. How do you see the uh, prospects for genuine foreign investment and competition given the um, counterbalancing push to uh, aid Chinese industry? It's, I think the starting point for that is really the lens through which you view your investments in China. And many 
uh, uh, private sector executives in Europe and the US are used to viewing China through a similar lens, which is to say that the security of the state exists to help support wealth creation. In China, that's inverted. Wealth creation exists to enhance the security of the state. And that's not to say that doesn't happen in other countries. An example of that is in the US. If you are doing military procurement, good luck if you're a non-US company being the supply chain provider for the US military. So it, it, there's no value judgment there, but it does tell you what the priorities are. And it's fascinating listening to Gao because it's there, the consensus around what needs to happen to to really save China from being over its skis for 20 years on the investment side is, is narrowing. It, we need to increase household consumption while not increasing debt. Yeah, it's simple, right? <laughs> no problem. And this is complicated, but that goal is getting subsumed under security concerns. So if economic reform is seen as a lesser lever to pull in order to enhance the stability of the state, then it's going to be sidelined. And I think your, your point is we've seen that happen repeatedly over the last five years uh, because of those priorities. And so as a multinational company, if you're thinking about foreign investment into China, that's a pretty critical lens for your success. If you're not going to be engaged, if you're not understanding that priority list and where your investment sits on it, then it's going to be challenging. So certainly there have been some uh, investment successes, but those have been uh, quite narrow. And I think reading the kind of economic indicators that business people are used to reading, uh, the top line GDP growth or numbers of X job creation, aren't helpful. Uh, those, and those average numbers in China, of course, are tremendously misleading. If you think about, look at our panel, right? So the average panelist is three quarters male, one quarter female, and some, you know, about five foot eight. That's <laughs> not all that helpful, right, <laughs> from a diligence <laughs> perspective. And that's exactly what's happening if you're looking at these, some of these top line numbers and not really digging into sectors. But I think really it's that, it's that prioritization that matters, and that's going to, again, have an impact on whether or not the partnerships with foreign companies are successful. Is there a bellwether reform that you would look to, either symbolic or substantial one, that, that would reassure you that, the, that they're serious about market reform? Well, there are two pieces that, that I haven't seen yet in any meaningful way that I, I would look to. And it's, again, those two basic metrics. Is credit being contained? And we see sort of lurching uh, reforms. There was some pullback in credit. We've seen loosening of credit. And of course, the property market in tier one cities reacted accordingly. We haven't seen meaningful reform in terms of household spend. And the numbers that, uh, that have been thrown out as indicative of it, I find uh, un uncompelling. For example, yes, service sector jobs have been growing. That, is, that, that could be positive. But if you, again, break that number down, it, so, first of all, service sector jobs aren't necessarily higher paying jobs than factory jobs. In fact, you get a lot more productivity by adding a machine to a human than you do by creating a, a noodle vendor on the corner. And if you look at where the service sector jobs are coming from, a third of them are large companies, and uh, a, or somewhere between about a third, maybe 30 percent. 70, somewhere between two thirds and 70 percent are sole proprietorships, which is to say, bodegas, right, mm -hmm. or uh, single operators, uh, operating companies, and those are not jobs that are leading to higher wages, higher household spend. You can put a hoodie on a noodle vendor, but that doesn't make him a tech entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, mm -hmm. when you have that kind of those sort of numbers, you're not really, your household spend, the average wages are going down, and without big wealth transfer. So if we followed the GAL plan, it's not the Gao plan for the media. It, if, if I drew my Karen's <laughs> version of what I heard Gao say, and if we got rid of 80% of state enterprises and somehow transferred those assets to households, that would be a huge step forward because you wouldn't be raising debt, you'd be taking away excess capacity, you'd be increasing household mm -hmm. spend. I, I'm not holding my breath for that to happen, and that's hard. And not, uh, this, is not, this is not a criticism of the Chinese government. That kind of dramatic reform is not something that can be undertaken easily or lightly. But within the absence of that kind of uh, strong activity, it's going to be very challenging to see China get anywhere near the growth rates that it projects. It, could it grow at 
maybe, but six to seven percent seems uh, ephemeral in light of the kind of structural changes that are needed. Mm -hmm. Brad Setzer, uh, China, of course, is an increasing influence on the global economy, what happens in China, but also the global economy influences events in China. Is the carrying out of this five-year plan in some sense dependent on what's happening in the world economy around it? Um, yes. Uh, you know, the external environment uh, supports China through China's export sector. And the external environment, given that China's currency is still more or less linked to the dollar, uh, the path of the dollar has a rather significant impact on China, on China's monetary policy, and on China's uh, capacity to achieve some of these goals, at least in the sense of how supportive the external environment will be. I think actually China's impact on the world, though, is in some ways uh, more interesting um, because many of the reforms which are positive for China's long run development, uh, as I think we have seen over the past two years, can be quite negative on other parts of the emerging world. And by that I mean if you think about China's macro economy, China stands out along two dimensions. One is that the state plays a much bigger role across a much broader set of sectors than is typical in any uh, advanced economy, any big economy, and it's hard to find other emerging economies, although I'm sure you can find one. Um, but then the second is that China has an exceptionally high level of savings that has supported an exceptionally high level of investment. And a lot of the reforms have the character of lowering, uh, at least in the near term and probably over time, that level of investment. And it turns out that Chinese imports, at least under the current uh, structure of, uh, of trade, are much more tied to the investment side of China's economy than to the consumption side of the economy. So as investment pulls back, you have a very clear impact on commodity exporting economies throughout the world. Uh, and there is, an, uh, in the short run, uh, at least over the past couple of years, there's been a pretty significant uh, negative shock from reforms that are viewed as insufficient inside China. And so I do think that there are very profound spillovers there. And there are also fairly profound spillovers if the rebalancing that everyone discusses comes through a significant fall in investment, but there's no change in savings. In macroeconomic terms, that means a bigger current account surplus. In domestic terms, that means there won't be enough jobs. And in external terms, that means there will likely be a devaluation, all of which would imply that China, rather than shifting its economy towards the consumer, would be shifting back to exports. And I think that is a very real risk if the rebalancing and restructuring of China's economy is not carried out successfully. And that's, in my view, why some of the reforms that would lower savings and support the consumer side of the economy are vital not just for China, but for the world. What about one Chinese export that is very much a matter of the moment, but really isn't dealt with uh, directly by the five-year plan, the export of capital, the outflow of capital from China and its potential effect on the currency. Is that uh, kind of a joker in this deck that could change the, the picture in terms of implementing the reforms? Uh, yes. Um, you know, let's... I, 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 I kind of push back a little bit against implementing reforms because it, it uh, leaves out the question of the sequencing of reform. Mm. And to my mind, uh, China has already made an error, not by uh, in the sequencing of its reform on the financial account liberalization. Uh, China pushed forward quite far on financial account liberalization, and there was a big run-up in short-term cross-border borrowing, uh, which after the August devaluation, August reform of the fixing uh, reversed itself very suddenly and led to very large capital outflows. The classic sequencing is that you first need to recapitalize your banks and first need to move towards more flexibility and only after you've done those two things do you liberalize the financial account. Mm -hmm. So this is not a case of where China didn't reform but it is arguably a case where China got the sequencing off and that 
contributed unquestionably to the pace of outflows. The uh, difficulty China faces is that uh, uh, the choices in China's exchange rate management could quite easily trigger large scale outflows. Uh, we saw that. The classic case for uh, outflows comes if you signal that you want a weaker currency, but don't allow the currency mo to move today to its weakest state. Because everyone says, I want to get out ahead of the next big move. Mm -hmm. And that process clearly played its way out in August. And it clearly was what was sort of so heavily on the market's mind in December and January. Uh, however, when China has taken steps to signal that it wants currency stability, the pace of outflows seemed to have moderated, seemed to moderate. And so I do think there is a path by which China can both reform and avoid a big depreciation, but it's a difficult one. Uh, we'll go to the members' questions in just a moment, but uh, Gao, I'm interested in your view on this about the ability to essentially control the capital outflow uh, dynamic and, and how it might bear on the reforms. Do you have a sense of uh, whether that's within the management capability of the state? Capability, I would say, yes. Putting this, I don't know. The, uh, about two months ago, in, um, during the, the, the Davos conference, um, many people were talking about the, uh, the problem with the Chinese um, currency and all those things. And uh, at the time, people thought that um, China wasn't going to be able to control it. And, and I talked to many CEOs of major investment banks and companies, and when I saw them, they all said, oh, when do you expect the Chinese government to totally close off the, uh, you know, to have a sudden uh, break on the on capital outflow? And we were, you know, I said I wasn't sure. I, I thought it could happen any time, you know, based on my uh, past experience. But you know, two months has passed, and the government doesn't, you know, hasn't done anything on that. In, uh, in fact, the things, you know, the the fear, the sort of panic, seemed to subside it. So you know, when I I, I I talked to many of my former colleagues at the central bank, and they were as soon as you touch this point, they they all stop short of saying anything. But you can, you, I get a sense that um, it is a problem, but they have to juggle these two very difficult decisions. And one thing, particularly, um, you know, I, the, to me, you know, enlightening is that this is, this is the word of a very important person there. He said, just think about it. You know, so much as we're saying, we try to control you know, capital account, you know, we allow the current account. But when you, when, you, when you actually look at the difference between the, these two accounts, the line between them becomes so blurred over the past 10, 20 years, it's, it's no longer possible to, to you know, take it apart. And now if you consider the number of Chinese, overseas Chinese, who deal you know, uh, substantially with the Chinese economy, it's 15 million. 15 million Chinese outside of China. Okay. Second number they gave me, last year, one, 120 million Chinese traveled outside of China and you know, did all these you know, sightseeing tours and all that sort of thing. And then, as of now, about 3 million Chinese students mm. are studying, in, you know, mostly in this country and many in other countries. So the person told me, he said, look, if, if you think about these numbers, you know, you, know, you, can, you can actually, you know, it's a very difficult for them to really put a wall somewhere and pull China back into the old days of uh, total foreign exchange control. So that's why they, I think at least the present leader should be in the central bank. Or, you know, they are, they are definitely, they are, you know, they, were, I, they are known to be uh, liberal on that side. But even with the pressure from everyone else, they, they still, they, you know, they, there's a lot of pushback there. So even with the people who are saying, no, you should close it down, you should stop the capital outflow. They can't do it. It's, if they start doing that, things would be a lot worse. Mm -hmm. And right now, it seems like you know, things are much better for them with the, you know, the recent uh, you know, uh, change of the, uh, of the trend. Mm -hmm. Yes, at least two months now, right? Right. <laughs> well, there must be some uh, follow-up on uh, our interesting start of the discussion. That's a long uh, list of uh, 
five-year plan items or other matters related to China. You have some real experts here uh, willing to uh, jump into this. Until we have a question, I want to raise the issue of, oh, Liz, hey, jump to the fore. Sorry, I was going to be generous and let the members start, but let me, let me start. Thank you for just really terrific discussion already. Um, I want to pick up on um, Karen's uh, humorous remark about putting a hoodie on a, on a noodle vendor, uh, and does that make a tech entrepreneur, and ask anybody on the panel to talk a little bit about the tech sector, um, because we read a lot about what's happening in sort of Chinese you know, college students now being much more entrepreneurial, being willing to drop out and you know, start their own firms. Can you talk about um, how you anticipate the tech sector developing in China, given sort of the educational system, given any other constraints you might sort of see around it? Is it real, or is it a bunch of froth, or what's going on? Anybody want to jump in on that? Yeah? Well, um, of course, as in anything else, in China, you always see the stop bifurcating development. Yeah, and on the one hand, you see all these cynicisms, you know, skepticism about this thing. Like you, you, you read probably you know, over 80% of the comments on the free you know, internet part, the part that's free, saying that, no, this is nonsense. You know, this is the, the, the call from the state council saying, uh, you know, this is 10,000 people being innovative, you know, like everyone trying to get into that. People say, oh, that's another round of uh, uh, having old retired people giving money to their ch kids to squander and then eventually lose all their retirement fund. But on the other hand, you see a lot of encouraging trends there. First of all, it's true that, you know, because I, I teach in university, and I, I, I teach in several universities, and I, I, on a daily basis I deal with all these youngsters, and people are getting much more enthused about coming out, working on something new, something technical, rather than going into a state enterprise or going into uh, like in, for many years in the past, go into the government. Because you know, the, 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 the national exam for, as a public servant had been the largest exam in China other than the, uh, you know, the college, college entrance exam because everyone wanted to get into the government, even though the government pays so little. So people always thought, well, it's because these people want to get in and to get benefit from the, you know, either corrupt practices or anything else. But this now, that's, that trend seemed to be slowly changing to the other side. Youngsters no longer you know, treat that as the, the most important thing. And secondly, you know, well, I have a group of people in Beijing. This, at first, it was mostly retired government officials um, trying to learn things. But eventually now, oh, within just a little more than a year, now it's that developed into a major platform in China. We call it Understanding Future. You know, a few years ago, this, another friend of mine was the, was the minister of uh, commerce, and you know, two other friends. We said we needed to call these youngsters, young scientists, to come in to explain to us. Once a month, we had this gathering like this, explaining to us, you know, any particular line of uh, science. After three goals, eventually we started to control crowd. And January this year, we had our first annual meeting. We said, okay, finally we're making it formal. Annual meeting. We had 800 places. We had 2,800 uh, applicants trying to go in. And we invited all these inventors from this country, from France, from Germany, from Japan, to talk in a conference. And it got so much enthusiasm, so much attention, that eventually we were able to. This is, it only happened one or two months ago. We, 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 were, we got these entrepreneurs to donate the money to establish a Nobel Prize type, science prize. Two, one is called uh, material science, $1 million each year for the next 10 years. Another called life science uh, prize. And uh, this is widely you know, known in China now. Everyone is getting, getting excited about it. So, so I think it's, uh, you know, it's getting there. But at you the know, same time, we try, to, we try to stay away from the government side because the Minister of Science comes in and says, OK, well, we would like to incorporate into our system. We say, that's great. You, you want to support it? But our committee is totally independent. So now they make me the, the, the chairman of the supervisor committee to make sure that it's not being interfered by anyone. Um, so this is, I think these things are coming up. And you know, China is a big country. 
even though many people criticize our educational system, saying that you know, it's stifling, it's you know, make people tunnel vision. The issue is that you know, with that many people, even if you get 1% of people coming out of it, you have a lot. So well, there's no, no question that online commerce is, is absolutely booming there. A lot of it's, as far as I can tell, pretty heavily subsidized by the, uh, by the uh, equity uh, investors as well as the lenders. But uh, the social media sector is uh, uh, something of a, of a conundrum. Um, Karen or Brad, any thoughts on that? Or no, I would just one? say first, is it frothy? Yes. Is the tech sector in the US frothy? Maybe just a little, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a universal enthusiasm. I, I, some of the, to the point about online, some of the most successful tech companies so far in China are what one a very clever commentator termed Galapagos companies, right? Uniquely situated for their isolated environment. So if you're regulatorily protected from international competition and you have a huge domestic market and a good role model, then and they've been very successful at creating last kilometer delivery and all of the items that you need, it, they're not employing millions of people. So it's not ultimately going to solve all of China's problems. And, that, and it does, the tech sector actually brings up the point, and Gao, you had raised this criticism of the Chinese education. There is an interesting conundrum about what is going to make a successful company over the next decade. And uh, what we're observing is with capital labor substitution, we've seen the labor advantage in China collapse relative to places like Mexico. What makes a company really innovative and thrive now is, is a normative understanding of what delights its customers. And that is a lot easier to develop through proximity, but you need to have the wealth to create those, to, to support those companies. And a lot less of this sort of export-led growth where the cheapest product can go anywhere to serve customers, much more localization, customization, and so forth. That could be an advantage for China or could mean they are cut off from uh, being able to access the European wealthy customers, the US wealthy customers that help drive growth. So in my mind, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, but certainly uh, there's, 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 a, there's a there there in the tech sector. I just don't know if it's uh, much like even the Silicon Valley. Will it save China? No. Probably not, but it's certainly an interesting element. Brad, would you put China in the top ranks technologically in the world in terms of uh, just focused on the internet here for, for a moment? It's a small subset of top ranks, but sure. I mean, Alibaba is a really big company. Um, there aren't that many non-Americans, so it's not that hard a thing. I'm going to have to go in a different direction, though, because I think uh, let's Let's t instead of talk exciting, high valuation, software, social media, let's talk boring, old tech world, supply chain and component manufacturing. Uh, and China is increasingly dominant in that sector. Uh, the, the, the old notion that China just assembles products at their last stage is, is way out of date. Uh, what is clearly happening is uh, more and more of the high-end components are being made inside China, and that shows up in a range of data, including a very sharp fall in the ratio of so-called processing or component imports relative to China's exports, and it's causing uh, important stresses uh, on some of the other Asian economies. And you know, you can talk about the internet and the sexy bits, but this does have uh, much more so in China than in other parts of the world a very big impact on the economy. And it is that high quality growth that the, that the State Council is looking for. We have a question two, question three. So uh, I'll start with you, please. Uh, Bhakti Merchandani, 1 William Street. Thank you for a wonderful discussion. The, the five-year plan has a couple of elements that would promote greater societal sta stability from rebalancing wealth from the cities to the countryside to improving welfare and health care as a way to encourage households to increase consumptions, um, as well as um, social reform, such as changing from the, the, the one-child policy. Uh, and at the same time, so all of those should increase societal st stability and reduce the likelihood of, of unrest. And at the same time, the economy is slowing, which moves in the opposite direction. So I'd love to understand what your thoughts are on, on that issue. 
Brett? So I actually think those soft reforms are absolutely essential for the reasons I articulated earlier. Uh, a high level of investment as it comes down is a large economic drag in a narrow sense, even if it is a movement towards a more efficient allocation of capital and therefore positive over the long run. How do you offset that? You offset that by giving people confidence that they can spend, which means giving people confidence in the quality of the public health system, which in China is still fairly weak. Uh, and does need significant investments. Uh, cro by cross-country comparisons, China still spends relatively little on public health, and public health is one of the most important determinants of savings. Uh, and then the other thing which is quite critical, and I think it's critical to be able to effectively carry out the restructuring of steel companies, is that remember that a steel company, when it fires people, or when it shuts down, it fires people, and if the people are tied to their province, which probably does little more than produce steel, and cannot uh, move without giving up their uh, hukou, uh, their, their capacity to obtain public services like education and health care is tied to remaining in a depressed community. And broadly speaking, that doesn't work. Uh, we have a lot of experience with that in our country. What works is when people have the freedom to move within the country to places where there are jobs and where there are better opportunities. And in order to do so, uh, to some meaningful extent, access to public health and to public education has to be decoupled from residency or your uh, hukou. And the, the five-year plan makes some important moves in that regard. Uh, but in, to my mind, it doesn't go nearly far enough it's incremental rather than revolutionary. So the social reforms are in the race with the restructuring and need to at least stay even. A uh, question right here at that same table. Hi, uh, Jim Shapiro from the Tata Group. So, so China, Chinese government has made a fairly significant commitment to uh, the Sustainable Development Goals. Could, could any of you comment a little bit on what, on, on how serious that you think that commitment is and whether you think it sort of helps or hurts the, 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 in terms of leveraging reform, for example, on, on pollution or the environment or climate change? Well, I think in a way, it's, um, it's just like what uh, Brett just said. It's um, incremental. And you can see, you know, the government is making a lot of noises and every time you, know, you, you keep hearing. So people become a little more cynical now because in the early days when the government says something, we do something. It was very effective, and the, the causal the relation was very clear. But now you hear a lot of noises. And on the other hand, there are all these different interest groups which are so difficult to be pushed around. But it's getting you know a little more and more in that direction because you know pollution is the one thing that's totally different from all these other sort of you know types of uh, social resources where the government could still cover up and you know put it under. The table, but this thing, everyone breathes the same kind of uh, air. Yeah, there have been rumors in Beijing uh, two years ago that uh, the Forbidden City is building up a big dome over it. <laughs> and, you know, I thought it's a joke, and some people truly believed it. They said, "Well, they're going to do that, so they're going to not to worry about us." I thought that's not possible at all. So, so in fact, many people are, you know, people are getting more and more vocal about it, and uh, you know, so much as the control of the media. This is something that you can't really control. You know, for, for, for quite a few years when you know, the government was trying to stop, you know, this is one, only in Beijing, the government would not allow the, uh, the uh, media to report on the numbers as publicized by a US embassy on the uh, pollution, only allowed by the Chinese side, which you know, sometimes is the same. I, I've been comparing the two, it's more or less the same, but sometimes you know, American side would have like much more serious pollution because of where they, they are located. But only in Beijing. In Shanghai, in, in Shenzhen, other places, Americans would, you know, would be treated the same and you can, you can read both. And the government is sort of, I don't know, it's not a government per se. And when people ask me if the government, I said, it's, it's one head of the nine-headed animal. So that one head probably is afraid that, you know, we don't want people to know that. But, but you know, the general awareness of it is so much so that I don't think any, any government agency can really cover it up. So.
question back here. Hi, uh, Matthew Herlock, I'm a lawyer. Um, my question is, with um, when I when we saw each other in Beijing last year, one of the themes that I heard talking to people was that SOEs were not investing abroad because of the anti-corruption drive, and they were afraid. Um, my question now is with Xi, the, the, the impression from abroad is that Xi is strengthening the center to keep stability to be sure he's in control of China. Um, what effect is the fear that that is generating having on economic activity in China, particularly what's it doing to SOEs in terms of freezing them or keeping them still? And also what effect is that having on sort of the, the dynamism of the private sector? If you don't know what the rules are, you don't know what the government's gonna say, that has to slow you down. What's your perception of that? Well, if you look at the numbers that was just out for last uh, no, quarter, they, uh, you know, it's a, on the surface, it's more encouraging because you know, the numbers are going up. But if you actually dissect it, you find that it's, it's all old story of you know, the heavy investment in all these. You know, it's, it, it's almost 90% you know, of state enterprises going into. So they're, they're sort of encouraged to invest more. And the service industry is actually coming down a little bit. That's mostly private enterprises. So, so in a way, many of these private enterprises are, are not being you know, very, very much encouraged in doing that because of various reasons. One of the reasons when you, you know, when you talk about going abroad, you know, because I've been teaching this course on cross-border merge acquisition. When you look at the numbers, you know, last year, you know, this past few years has been exponential increase in the number. But the number you know, is interesting because if you look at the state enterprises and the private enterprises, more and more private enterprises start to go out and start to buy things outside. And, and we, we sort of, uh, you know, uh, guess, and I, I tried to uh, confirm that with the, my central bank and the safe people, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't want to disclose their views. But I think they, they sort of, you know, they, they, they were nodding when I said, look, you know, all these, all these private enterprises are going out, many of them, I ask them, they say, well, it's, it's not because I want to, I think it's cheaper to buy things outside, but it's safer to hold things outside. So many of the people are doing that. And state enterprises were always encouraged to go out if they can. But now, with the anti-corruption, people basically start to sit there and say, okay, whatever I do, you know, there will be something wrong, so why don't I just not do anything? And my, my former employee, employer, uh, CIC now, is being very careful with whatever decision making. Because in, in my days, when our, our uh, typical length of decision on any particular investment will be you know, within probably a month or two. Now it's, they say, average is a six month. Uh, and most, many of my you know, former colleagues on the lower ranks to complain to me, they, they come to my office all the time and say, okay, well, I've, I've been working on this for four months and now you know, we took it to the uh, investment committee, within 10 minutes it was vetoed, it was uh, you know, turned down. Simply because most people want to, sell, want to see, want to be put on record that, okay, this is risky. They just want to say it, so that you know, whether or not it gets anything, we don't care. But so long as I, I don't, you know, I'm not get, getting criticized later if something goes wrong. Now, that it in itself is not indication that the state interests are not going to work. It's just this particular you know, type of fear at present time. So as soon as it changes, because you can see Mr. Xi, Mr. Li constantly come out and say, Okay, we're we're not. I, and Mr. Wang, the uh, the czar of the party discipline, um, saying that it's corruption itself. It's bad enough, but those people who do not work, those people who sit there not doing anything, is bad too. So now you can see there's probably going to be some pushback in that regard. And by by fall of next year, by summer, late summer of next year, you'll see a lot better. In that regard, you, you're asking the indications. Mm -hmm. By that time, you see the the change of heads of many industries, many uh, major state enterprises in the many ministries, and and possibly the central bank, possibly the Ministry of Finance, Ministry of Commerce. If you see the people coming in, then by you know knowing who the person will be, then you know you get a better chance, better uh, indication as to whether or not the government is moving forward or stay still. Interesting. Karen. Well, there's also there's an economic reality, Matthew. I mean, if you there was a study done at Peking University that compared 
what banks were declaring as their interest income versus what companies were paying on their interest income. And it turns out that the return on those investments was actually 2%. That's what was being collected. So if you're a company getting a 2% return in China where the laws are shifting, where there aren't, there's not a lot of liquidity, where there's not opacity, versus the same return on a corporate investment in the United States, the risk premium does kind of weight you towards looking abroad. And that's going to be true for Chinese <coughs> investors, for multinational investors too. That has certainly had to have had some influence on the outbound M&A activity that we're seeing as well. You know, the reality on the ground is, is absolutely fascinating. I did, there's also that, that top line sort of outside in return aspect that uh, will influence investment going forward. I can give another indication of what's going on with this uh, sort of uh, what I would say what's wrong with the financial system. When, when you, because I've, I've been serving as an arbitrator in many cases in the past two years. I, I restarted my lawyering, but I'm, I usually I only do the head arbitration. Uh, the, the one interesting thing I found is that you know, the, the, over the past two and a half years, I had altogether about 15 16 cases. 90% of them are all about uh, uh, loan problems. Somewhat, you know, uh, go back on the loan. And the average uh, contract of these loans for, for the, the rate of the loans, take a guess. You know, the Chinese, you know, the Chinese banking loans are always uh, regulated. Mm -hmm. And so you always have a number that's, that's uh, um, stipulated by the central bank. And they always have, you have a very narrow um, a tunnel, you know, where you can move. So it's basically within six, seven percent. But I was surprised. See, you know, I had more than a dozen of these cases. Every one of them has a loan rate much higher than that, and uh, the lowest guess, lowest uh, loan rate for these contracts, twenty-four percent. Wow, it's the lowest on these, and the highest, of course, over 100%. But the, the, the more interesting thing is this. Uh, last year, the Supreme Court came out with a set of uh, what they call explanation of the laws, because our Congress moves very slowly in changing the laws. So the Supreme Court now is getting bolder and bolder, coming out to explain what the law is. And last year, last sep September, we had a new set of rules, which says, despite the Supreme Court, not by the law, which says the courts should recognize the legality of the loan agreements with a, with a rate below 24%. You know, 24% to us was always a usury rate. You know, we always thought 6 7% is all right, maybe you know, 8 9 but 24%. And then you, you read on, the court says, if it's below 36%, we're not going to overturn it. So basically what they're saying is that we're not going to say it's illegal. It's beyond a 36 percent that's illegal. So what happens is when you, in, I, so I dig harder into it and say, why would anyone be willing to pay that much? Now you realize that most of the, state, the private enterprises do not have enough you know, resources. They can't go to the banks to get loans. And the very inefficient state enterprises and all people with, with power, with you know, strings to pull, they get the loans from the state banks they turn around because you know steel mills and these people they can get a loan, but but if you put in as they say, for every thousand dollars I put in, I lose you know a hundred dollars. So why do I want to do it? So they turn around and they give the loan to someone else with a markup. So now from six percent they get to eight percent, eight percent. Then you have all these people in the middle. Eventually gets twenty four percent. And the interesting thing is that the law, you know, the, at least the legal system now recognizes that. We're, <clears throat> we're almost out of time, so let me wrap up with a pop question here that's not, certainly not in the five-year plan, although it has a lot to do with China and the world economy. <clears throat> Will we see Facebook in China in some form in the next year? You already have it. We have a much better one, WeChat. <clears throat> I don't know how, how many of you use that. So of course, WeChat from time to time will be blocked by the government. But people always have ways to get around. I get WeChat every day, and every day I get, I get certain information which is like blocked or being reported for pornography or incorrect you know, things. But still, 
it's, you know, it, it goes very fast. Over almost 600 million people use it now. This is the largest thing, you know. So, so it's not Facebook, but, uh, but in today's world, it becomes increasingly more difficult to really to control information flow. Hmm. Okay, any, either of you happen to have a view on this? I think we got the answer yeah, there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> a better one. <laughs> Favored Chinese enterprise. Well, thank you very much to the panel. Thank you to the members. <laughs>